All right, we are going to continue with A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. I have a conflict, but I don't want to stop our progress. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share 30 minutes of our read aloud and hope to see you all on Thursday for our continuation of this book. We're on page 229. We're reading starting with chapter 25. Pip placed her knife and fork across her plate with exaggerated precision. Now, may I leave the table? She looked at her mom, who was scowling. I don't see what the rush is, she said. I'm just right in the middle of my capstone project and I want to hit my targets before bed. Sure, off you go, Pickle. Her dad reached over to scrape Pip's leftovers onto his own plate. Vic, her mom now turned the scowl on him as Pip stood and tucked in her chair. Oh, honey, some people have to worry about their kids rushing off from dinner to inject heroin into their eyeballs. Be thankful it's homework. What's heroin, Josh said as Pip left the room. She took the steps two at a time, leaving her shadow, Barney, at the foot of the stairs, his head tilting in confusion as he tried to follow her to that dog-forbidden place. She'd had the chance to think over all things Nancy Tango tits at dinner, and she'd had an idea. Pip closed her bedroom door, pulled out her phone, and dialed. Hello, muchacha, Kara chimed down the line. Hey. Pip said, are you busy binging the crown or do you have a few minutes to help me be sneaky? I'm always available for sneakiness. What do you need? Is Naomi in? No, in Manhattan this week. Why? Suspicion crept into Kara's voice. Okay, sworn to secrecy? Always. What's up? Pip said, I've heard rumors about an old calamity party that might give me a lead for my capstone project, but I need to find proof which is where the sneakiness comes in. She hoped she'd played it just right, omitting Max's name and downplaying it enough that Kara wouldn't worry about her sister leaving just enough gaps to intrigue her. Ooh, what rumors, she said. Pip knew her too well, and she hated that she was doing this, manipulating her. When, when did she become this person? Nothing substantial yet, but I need to look through old calamity photos. That's where I need your help. Hit me. Max Hastings' Facebook profile is a decoy, you know, for employers and colleges. His actual one is under a fake name and he has really strict privacy settings. I can only see things that Naomi is tagged in. And you want to log in as Naomi so you can look through Max's old photos? Bingo, Pip said, sitting down on her bed and dragging the laptop over. Can do, Kara's voice thrilled. Technically, we're not snooping on Naomi, so this doesn't technically break any rules. Plus, Nye should learn to change her password sometime. She has the same one for everything. Can you get on her laptop, Pip said? Just opening it now. Pip heard the tapping of keys over the phone. She could picture Kara now, that giant top knot she always wore when she was dressed in pajamas, which was, in Kara's case, as often as physically possible. Okay, she's still signed in on here. I'm on. Can you click on security settings, asked Pip. Yep. Uncheck the box next to login alerts so she won't know I'm logging in from a new machine. Done. Okay, Pip said. That's all the hacking I need from you. Kara read out Naomi's email address and Pip entered it into the Facebook login page. Her password is Isabel0612, Kara said. Pip typed it in. Thanks, comrade. Stand down. Loud and clear, although if Naomi finds out, I'm throwing you under this bus. Understood, said Pip. Hey, so I texted that girl I met at the movie theater, Kara said tentatively. Oh shit, sorry, Pip exhaled. I should have asked. Has she replied? Not yet, you know, because I'm destined to be forever alone. Well, can you be forever alone with me, Pip said, and she will reply. Tell me as soon as she does. All right, Plops, Dad's yelling, gotta go. Okay, bye. Pip dropped the phone and clicked to log in. Naomi's news feed was filled with cats, video recipe videos, and motivational quotes over pictures of sunsets. Pip typed Nancy Tango Tits into the search bar and clicked on Max's page. It didn't take long for Pip to realize why Max had two profiles. 
There's no way he would have wanted his parents to see what he got up to away from home. Photos of him in clubs, his blonde hair stuck to his sweaty forehead, jaw tensed and his eyes reeling and unfocused. Posing with his arms around girls, sticking his tongue out of the camera, shirt splattered with spilled drinks. All those were just the recent ones. Pip clicked to Max's photos and began the long scroll down toward 2014. It was all much of the same, clubs, bars, bleary eyes. There was a brief respite from Max's nocturnal activities with a series of photos from a ski trip. Max standing in the snow wearing just a Speedo. She finally reached 2014 and took herself back to January before looking through the photos properly, studying each one. Most were of Max smiling in the foreground, usually accompanied by Naomi, Jake, Millie, or Sal. Pip lingered for a long time on a photo of Sal flashing his brilliant smile while Max licked his cheeks. Her gaze switched between the two drunk and happy boys looking for any trace of the secrets that had existed between them. Pip searched through photos of Max in crowds, looking for Andy's face in the background, for anything suspicious in Max's hand, for him lurking too close to any girl's drink. She clicked forward and back through so many photos of calamity parties that her tired eyes saw them as flipbook moving pictures until she found the photos from that night. And everything became sharp and static again. Pip leaned forward. Max had taken and uploaded 10 photos from the night Andy disappeared. Pip immediately recognized Max's house and everyone's clothes from that day. Added to Naomi's three and Millie's six that made a total of 19 photos from that night. 19 shots that existed alongside Andy Bell's last hours of life. Pip shivered and pulled the duvet over her feet. The photos were similar to the ones Millie and Naomi had taken. Max and Jake gripping controllers and staring out of frame. Millie and Max posing with filters superimposed over their faces. Naomi in the background staring down at her phone, unaware of the posed photo going on behind her. Four best friends without their fifth. That's when Pip noticed the timestamp. When it had been just Millie and Naomi's uploads, it was simply a coincidence. But now that she was looking at Max's too, there was a pattern. All three of them had uploaded their photos from that night on Monday the 21st between 9.30 and 10 p.m. Wasn't it a little strange that in the midst of all the craziness of Andy's disappearance, they all decided to post these photos at almost the exact same time? And why upload these photos anyways? Naomi said she and the others had decided on that Monday night to tell the police the truth about Sal's alibi. Was uploading these photos the first step in that decision to stop hiding Sal's absence? Pip typed up some notes about the upload coincidence. Then she clicked save and closed the laptop. She got ready for bed, wandering back from the bathroom with her toothbrush in her mouth, humming as she scribble, scribbled her to-do list for tomorrow. Write personal essay underlined three times. With a sniff and a jerk, Pip sat bolt upright in bed. She leaned against the headboard and rubbed her eyes as her mind stirred awake. She pressed the home button on her phone. 4.47 a.m. What had woken her? Something stirred on the edge of her brain, a vague thought beyond the span of just awake comprehension, but she knew where it was drawing her. Pip slid quickly out of bed, the cold room stinging her exposed skin. She grabbed her laptop and took it back to bed, wrapping the duvet around her. Blinded by the backlight of her computer, she opened up Facebook, still signed in as Naomi, and navigated her way back to Nancy Tango Tits and the photos from that night. She looked through them all once and then back again a little slower. She stopped on the second to last picture. All four friends were in the frame. Naomi was sitting with her back to the camera looking down, though she was in the background. You could just make out the lock screen on her phone in her hands. The main focus of the photo was on Max, Millie, and Jake, the three of them standing by the near side of the sofa, smiling as Millie rested her arms over both boys' shoulders. Max was still holding a controller in his outside hand, and Jake's disappeared out of shot on the right. Pip shivered. 
the camera must have been at least five feet in front of them to get that much in the frame. And the dead silence of the night, Pip whispered, who's taking the picture? 26. It was Sal. It had to be. Despite the cold, Pip's blood raced warm and fast, hammering through her heart. She moved mechanically, a thousand thoughts shouting over each other, but she listened to only one. She downloaded the trial version of Photoshop, saved Max's photo, and opened the image in the program. She enlarged the photo and then sharpened it. Her skin flashed cold and then hot again. There was no doubt about it. The numbers projected on Naomi's phone read 1209. The friends said Sal left at 1030. But here they were, all four of them, at nine minutes past midnight, and not one of them could have taken the photo themselves. Max's parents were away that night, and no one else had been there. That's what they've always said. It was just the five of them until Sal left at 1030 to go kill his girlfriend. And here was proof that that was a lie. There was a fifth person there at midnight, and who could it be but Sal? Pip scrolled to the topmost section of the enlarged photo. There was a window behind the sofa on the far wall, and in the center pane was the flash of the phone camera. You couldn't distinguish the figure holding the phone from the darkness of outside, but just beyond the streaks of white from the flash, there was a faint halo of blue in the reflection. The very same blue as the shirt Sal was wearing that night. The one Robbie still wore sometimes. Pip's stomach flipped at the thought of his name, imagining the look in his eyes when he saw this photo. She copied and pasted the enlarged image to a blank document and cropped it to show only Naomi with her phone on one page and the flash in the window in the other. Along with the original saved photo, she sent each page to the wireless printer on her desk. She watched from her bed as it sputtered out each sheet, closing her eyes for just a moment listening to it rattle. Pips, can I come in and vacuum? Pips eyes snapped open. She pulled herself up from her slumped position, the right side of her body aching from hip to neck. You're still in bed, her mom said, opening the door. It's after one, lazy. I thought you were already up. No, I, Pip said, her throat dry and scratchy, I was just tired, not feeling so well. Could you do Josh's room first? Her mom paused and looked at her, her warm eyes strained with worry. You're not overworking yourself, are you, Pip? She said. We've talked about this. No, I promise. Her mom closed the door and Pip climbed out of bed. She got ready, pulling her jeans on with a dark green shirt, fighting to get the brush through her hair. She picked up the three photo printouts, placed them in a plastic folder, and slid them inside her backpack. Then she scrolled to the recent calls list in her phone and dialed. Ravi, what's up, Sarge? Meet me outside your house in 10 minutes. I'll be in the car. Okay, what's on the menu today? More blackmail, side order of breaking and enter? It's serious. Be there in 10. Sitting in her passenger seat, his head almost touching the roof of the car, Ravi stared down, open-mouthed at the photo in his hands. It was a long while before he said anything. They sat in silence. Pip watched as Ravi traced his finger over the fuzzy blue reflections in the far window. Sal never lied to the police, he said eventually. No, he didn't, Pip said. I think he left Max's at 1215, just like he originally said. It was his friends who lied. And they took away his alibi. This means he's innocent, Pip. His big round eyes fixed on hers. That's what we're here to test. Come on. She opened the door and stepped out. She picked up, picked Robbie up and had driven him straight to his grassy patch on Weevil Road, leaving her, lar her hazard lights flashing. Robbie closed the door and followed and Pip started up the road. How are we testing that? The only way to be sure Sal didn't do it is an Andy Bell murder reenactment. Her steps fell in time with his to see with Sal's new time of departure from Max's whether he still would have had enough time to kill her. They turned left down Cortland and traipsed all the way to Max Hastings sprawling house where this had all begun five and a half years ago. Pip pulled her phone out. We should give the pretend prosecution the benefit of the doubt, she said. Let's say that Sal left Max's just after that photo was taken 
at 10 minutes past midnight. What time did your dad say Sal got home? Around 12.50, he replied. Okay. Let's allow for some misremembering and say it was more like 12.55, which means that Sal had 45 minutes door to door. We have to move fast, Robbie. Use the mini, use the minimum possible time it might have taken to kill her and dispose of her body. Normal teenagers sit at home and watch TV on Sunday, he said. All right, starting the stopwatch. Now, Pip turned on her heels and, heels and marched back up the road the way they'd come. Robbie at her side. Her steps fell somewhere between a fast walk and a slow jog. Eight minutes and 47 seconds later, they reached her car and her heart was already pounding. This was the intercept point. Okay, she turned the key in the ignition and pulled back onto the road. So this is Andy's car and she has intercepted Sal. Let's say that she was driving for a faster pickup time and now we go to the first quiet spot where the murder theoretically could have taken place. She hadn't been driving long before Ravi pointed. There, he said. That's quiet and secluded. Turn off here. Pip pulled off onto the small dirt road packed in by tall hedges. A sign told them that the winding single lane road led down to a farm. Pip stopped the car where a widened passing place was cut into the bushes and said, now we get out. They didn't find any blood in the front of the car, just the trunk. Pip glanced at the ticking stopwatch app as Ravi was crossing around the front to meet on her side of the car. 1529, 1530. Okay, she said, let's say that right now we're arguing. It's starting to get heated. Could have been about Andy selling drugs or the secret older guy. Sal is upset. Andy's shouting back. Pip hummed tunelessly, rolling her hands to fill the time of the imaginary scene. And right about now, maybe Sal finds a rock on the road or something heavy from Andy's car. Maybe no weapon at all. Let's give him at least 40 seconds to kill her. They waited and she watched the muscles in Robbie's jaw clench and release. So now Andy's dead. Pip pointed down at the gravel road. He opens the trunk. Pip opened her trunk and puts her in sideways with where her blood was found. She bent down and lifted the invisible body, struggling to lay it on the carpeted trunk floor. Then she stepped back and shut it. Now back in the car, Ravi said. Pip checked the timer. 2002, 2003. She put the car in reverse and swung out onto the main road. Sal's driving now, she said. His fingerprints get to the steering wheel and around the dashboard. He'd been thinking of how to dispose of her body. The closest possible foresty area is Lodge Park, so maybe he'd come off Weevil Road here, she said, swerving the woods appearing on her left. And he'd have needed to find a place to get the car up close to the woods, said Robbie. They chased the woods for several minutes, searching for such a place, until the road grew dark under a tunnel of trees pressing in on either side. There, they spotted one together, Pip signaled and pulled off onto the grassy patch bordering the forest. I'm sure the police searched here a hundred times as they are the closest woods to Max's house, she said. But let's just say Sal managed to hide the body here. Pip and Robbie got out of the car once more, 26, 18. So he opens the trunk and drags her out. Pip recreated the action, noticing Ravi avert his eyes. He'd probably had nightmares about this very scene, his older brother dragging a dead and bloodied body through the trees. But maybe after today, he'd never have to picture it again. Sal would have had to take her pretty far in, away from the road, she said. Pip mimicked dragging the body, her back bent, staggering slowly backward. Up here is fairly hidden. Robbie said once Pip had dragged her about 200 feet through the trees. Yep, she let go of Andy, 29.48. Okay, she said, so the hole has always been a problem. How he could have had time to dig one deep enough anyway, but now that we're here, she glanced around and dappled the dappled woods. There are quite a few downed trees. Maybe he didn't need to dig much at all. Maybe he found a shallow ditch already made for him. Like there she pointed to a large mossy dip in the ground, a tangle of old roots creeping through it, still attached to a long fallen tree. He would have needed to make it deeper, Robbie said. She's never been found. Let's allow three or four minutes for digging. Agreed. 
When the time came, she dragged Andy's body into the hole, and then he would have needed to fill it again, cover her with dirt and debris. Let's do it then, said Robbie, his face determined now. He stabbed his boot into the dirt and kicked a spray of soil into the hole. Pip followed suit, pushing mud, leaves, and twigs in to fill the small ditch. Robbie was on his knees, sweeping whole armfuls of earth over and on top of Andy. Okay, Pip said when they were done, eyes in the hole now invisible against the forest floor. So now she's buried. Sal heads back. 37.59. They jogged back to Pip's car and climbed inside, kicking mud all over the floor. Pip did a three-point turn, swearing when a four-by-four four barreled by. When they were back on Weevil Road, she said, Right now, Sal drives to Monroe, where Howie Bowers lives, and he ditches Andy's car. They pulled into the road a few minutes later, and Pip parked out of sight of Howie's bungalow. She locked the car behind them. And now we walk to my house, Robbie said, trying to keep up with Pip, her steps breaking into an almost run. They were both concentrating too hard for words, their eyes down on their pounding feet, treading in, allegedly, Sal's years old footsteps they arrived outside of the sing's house breathless a sheen of sweat had broken out on pip's upper lip she wiped it on her sleeve and pulled out her phone she stopped the timer and stared at the numbers hairs raising all over her body she looked at ravi what his eyes were widened and searching so we gave sal an upper limit time window of 45 minutes between locations and our reenactment worked with the closest possible locations and was almost inconceivably efficient. Yes, it was the speediest of murders and... Pip held her phone out to him and showed him the timer. 58 minutes and 19 seconds, Ravi read aloud. Ravi, his name fizzed on her lips and she broke into a smile. Sal couldn't have possibly done it. He's innocent, the photo proves it. Shit, he stepped back and covered his mouth, shaking his head. He didn't do it. Sal's innocent. He made a sound, gravelly at first, and then a quick bark of laughter, laced with disbelief. A smile unfolded slowly across his face, and he laughed again, the sound pure and warm. Pip's cheeks flushed with the heat of it. And then Robbie looked up at the sky. The sun on his face and the laugh became a yell. He roared up into the sky, neck strained, eyes screwed shut. People stared at him from across the street, and curtains twitched in houses, but Pip knew he didn't care. And neither did she. Her eyes prickled with tears as she watched him in this raw, confusing moment of happiness and grief. Robbie looked down at her, and the roar cracked into laughter again. Before Pip knew what was happening, he'd wrapped his arms around her and lifted her from her feet. Something bright whirred through her, a feeling with wings. Robbie's breath was in her ear, laughing and crying as he spun her round and around. We did it, he said, putting her down so clumsily that she tripped over his feet. He stepped back and wiped his eyes, looking suddenly embarrassed. We actually did it. Is it enough? Can we go to the police with that photo? I don't know, Pip said. She didn't want to take this away from him, but she really wasn't sure. Maybe it's enough to convince them to reopen the case. Maybe it isn't. But we need answers first. We need to know why Sal's friends lied, why they took his alibi away from him. Come on. Robbie took one step and hesitated. You mean, ask Naomi? She nodded and he drew back. You should go alone, he said. Naomi won't talk if I'm there. She physically can't talk. I bumped into her last year and she burst into tears just looking at me. Are you sure, Pip said? You, out of everyone, deserve to know what they did, that why they did it. It's the way it has to be, trust me. Be careful, Sarge. Okay, I'll call you right after. Pip wasn't quite sure how to leave him. She didn't want to leave him. She touched his arm and walked away carrying that look on Robbie's face with her. 27. Pip walked backwards toward her car on Monroe. Her tread much lighter on this return journey. Lighter because now they knew for sure Sal Singh did not kill Andy Bell. 
She called Kara. Well, hello, sister, Kara answered. What are you doing now, Pip asked. Homework club with Naomi and Max. They're doing job apps and I'm working on my capstone project. You know, I can't focus alone. Pip's chest tightened. Both Max and Naomi are there now? Yep. Is your dad in? Nah, he's over at my Aunt Lila's for the afternoon. Okay, I'm coming over, Pip said. Be there in 10. Fab, I can steal some of your focus. Pip said goodbye and hung up. She felt an ache of guilt for Kara that she was there and would now be involved in whatever was about to come out because Pip wasn't bringing focus to the homework club. She was bringing an ambush. Kara opened the front door, wearing her penguin pajamas and bear claw slippers. Hey, Chica, she said, rubbing Pip's head messily. Happy Sunday. Me club de homeworko es su club de homeworko. Pip closed the front door and followed Kara into the kitchen. We've banned talking, Kara said, holding the door open for her, and no typing too loudly like Max does. Pip stepped into the kitchen. Max and Naomi were sitting next to each other at the table, laptops and papers splayed out in front of them, steaming mugs of coffee in their hands. Kara's place was on the other side, a mess of paper and pens strewn across her keyboard. Hey, Pip, Naomi smiled. How you doing? Fine, thanks, Pip said, her voice suddenly raw. When Pip looked at Max, he turned his gaze away immediately, staring down at the surface of his taupe covered co colored coffee. Hi, Max, she said pointedly, forcing him to look back at her. He raised a small closed mouth smile, which might have looked like a greeting to Kara and Naomi, but Pip knew better. It was meant as a grimace. Pip walked over to the table and dropped her backpack onto it just across from Max. It thumped against the surface, making the lids of all three laptops jutter with their hinges. Pip loves homework, Kara explained to Max, aggressively so. Kara slid back into her chair and wiggled the mouse to bring her computer back to life. Well, sit, she said, using a foot to pull out a chair out from under the table. Its feet shrieked against the floor. What's up, Pip? Naomi said. Do you want some caffeine? And what are you looking at? Max cut in. Max? Naomi hit him roughly on the arm with a pad of paper. Pip could see Kara's confused face in her periphery, but she didn't take her eyes away from Naomi and Max, anger pulsing through her. She hadn't known until she saw their faces that this was how she would feel. She thought she would be relieved it was all over, that she and Robbie had done what they set out to do, but their faces made her seethe. There weren't just small deceits and innocent gaps in memory anymore. This was a calculated, life-changing lie, and she would not look away or sit until she knew why. I came here first, just as a courtesy, she said, her voice shaking. Because, Naomi, you've been like a sister to me nearly my whole life. Max, I owe you nothing. Pip, what are you talking about, Kara said, her voice strained with the beginnings of worry. Pip unzipped her bag and pulled out the plastic folder. She leaned across the table and laid the three printed images out on the space between Max and Naomi. This is your chance to explain before I go to the police. What do you have to say, Nancy Tango Tits? She glared at Max. What are you talking about? He scoffed. That's your photo, Nancy. It's from the night Andy Bell disappeared, isn't it? Yes, Naomi said quietly, but why? The night Sal left Max's house at 1030 to go and kill Andy? Yes, it is, Max spat. What point are you trying to make? If you stop blustering for one second and look at the photo, you'll see my point, Pip snapped back. Obviously, if you'd paid any attention to detail, you wouldn't have uploaded it in the first place. So I'll explain. Both you and Naomi, Millie and Jack are in this picture. Yeah, so, he said. So, Nancy, who took the picture of the four of you? Naomi's eyes widened, her mouth hanging open as she stared down at the photo. Yeah, okay, Max said. So maybe Sal took the photo. It's not like we said he wasn't there at all. He must have taken this earlier in the night. Nice try, Pip said. But my phone. Naomi's face fell and she reached up to hold it in her hands. The time is on my phone. Max went quiet, looking down at the printouts, a muscle tensing in his jaw. Well, you can hardly see those numbers. You must have doctored this photo, he said. No, Max, I got it from your Facebook 
as it is. Don't worry, I've researched this. The police can ex access it, even if you delete it now. I'm sure they'd be very interested to see it. Naomi turned to Max, her cheeks reddening. Why didn't you check properly? Shut up, he said, quiet but firmly. We're going to have to tell her, Naomi said, pushing back her chair with a scrape that cut right through Pip. Shut up, Naomi, Max said again. Oh my God. Naomi stood and started pacing the length of the table. We have to tell her. Stop talking, Max said, getting to his feet and grabbing Naomi by the shoulders. Don't say anything else. She'll go to the police, Max, Naomi said, tears pooling in the grooves around her nose. We have to tell her. Max took a deep breath, jittering breath, eyes darting between Pep and Naomi. Fuck, he shouted, letting go of Naomi and kicking out at the leg, table leg. What the hell is going on? Kara pulled at Pip's sleeve. Tell me, Naomi, Pip said. Max fell back into his chair, his blonde hair in wilting clumps across his face. Why did you do this? He looked up at Pip. Why couldn't you just leave everything alone? Pip ignored him. Naomi, tell me, she said. Sal didn't leave Max's party at 10.30 that night, did he? He left at 12.15, just like he told the police. He never asked you all to lie to give him an alibi. He actually had one. He was with you. Sal never once lied to the police. You all did on that Tuesday. You lied to take away his alibi. Naomi squinted as tears glazed her eyes. She looked at Kara and then slowly over to Pip, and she nodded. Pip blinked. Why? End of chapter 27. On Thursday, we'll start on chapter 28, page 249. Pretty awesome book. Um, you might think we're getting close. Uh, we are getting close, but this is a super twisty book, and it's going to take you on a wild ride in the last few chapters. Have a great day.